You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side of history. My name is Steve Silverman, and today's story is titled The Sikorsky Sweater Girls. But before we do that, let's start with today's question of the day. And for today's question of the day, I thought I'd ask you about the category of pop music. I was recently surprised to find out that only 10 Australian acts had ever topped the Billboard Hot 100 chart here in the United States. Even more surprising was that only five of these acts were truly Australian. The other five were either born in another country or consisted of a prominent member who was born in another country. So my question for you today is, Which native Australian act was the first to ever top the Billboard singles chart here in the United States? Here are your choices in alphabetical order. And yes, all of these acts did hit number one. Was it one, Air Supply, two, the Bee Gees, three, Andy Gibb, four, Olivia Newton-John, or five, Helen Reddy? Again, which native Australian act was the first ever to top the Billboard singles chart here in the United States? Was it one, Air Supply, two, the Bee Gees, three, Andy Gibb, four, Olivia Newton-John, or five, Helen Reddy? And as always, I'll let you ponder over these choices and I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. And now for today's story on the Sikorsky Sweater Girls, which first appeared in the press on February 11th of 1943. Now this was the height of World War II, and since so many American men were overseas fighting at the time, and as you probably know, women were recruited to work in the factories to help with the war effort. On this date, 53 women were fired from the Vought Sikorsky Aircraft Division of United Aircraft Corporation, which was located in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The reason? It's very simple. The women were wearing sweaters, which was against corporate policy. Now, I should point out that wearing a sweater was not against the rules for all women employed by the company. It was only against the rules for those that worked on the production line. If a woman works, say, in a clerical position, you know, as a secretary or something like that, sweaters were completely acceptable. Now, keep in mind that this was during the height of the Hollywood sweater girl phenomena. I have to be honest, this is something I was oblivious to until I started uh, researching the story. That's when women of the big screen wore tight-fitting sweaters with bullet bras to accentuate their curves. And I'll let you use your imagination to figure out which curves of the female form I'm referring to. And, as with many trends uh, created by celebrities, the sweater fad quickly spread to the general population. And there lies the problem. You see, women wearing these snug sweaters were considered to be a safety hazard on the manufacturing line. And for a brief moment, two thoughts went through my head. First, maybe the yarn you know, got caught, unraveled, and somehow pulled the woman into the machine. Or second, and this is the maleness in me speaking, maybe the bullet bras were way too pointy and something stuck out and they got pulled into the machinery that way. But that was just totally wrong. It turns out the women were in no danger at all. It's the men they were concerned with. It was believed that the sweater girls were a distraction to the men. You know, they would take their eyes off of whatever they were doing and, of course, refocus on the wrong thing, make that a pair of wrong things. Then... Oops, you know, loss of finger, loss of hand, or even possibly loss of life. A 1942 U.S. government report stated, quote, Lay down the law. No sweaters allowed. If a pulchritudinous girl wears one, she can usually demoralize a plant in 10 minutes. Not only will the men have a hard time making their eyes behave, but the other women will rise up in indignation. And that's the end of the quote. And that's exactly what the Vought Sikorsky plant did. The female workers in the plant were required to wear what was referred to as a jeep suit, which was basically a two-piece blue denim outfit. You know, think Rosie the Riveter here. Um, The women, at least those working in this aircraft plant, hated them. 
The Jeep suits were just too bulky, they were hard to work in, and worst of all, they were expensive. And if you listen to the press, what they really, really hated about them is that they were just unattractive. As a result, many of the women chose to wear their sweaters instead. Not only were they more attractive and lower in cost than these ugly Jeep suits, the women could easily roll up the sleeves while they were working. And after numerous complaints, the Vought Sikorsky management relaxed the dress code a bit. They allowed the female employees to wear their own blouses and slacks, but they still stuck to their outright ban of sweaters. And the women continued to wear their sweaters. At least that was until the 53 women were sent home on that cold February day. Now, in a show of support, an additional 22 women also walked off the job. And this made the news nationally. It was a bad situation, you know, publicity-wise for the company. But they weren't doing anything until all the male co-workers threatened to walk off the job also. And that's when they decided to listen. They allowed the women to return to work, and they sought out some sort of agreement between management and labor. At the urging of their union officials, the women returned to work the very next day without their sweaters on. They awaited a decision on whether they could or couldn't wear them in the future. While an agreement was being ironed out between the labor union and the company, others from around the country offered their own opinions. An official at Grumman Aircraft on Long Island was quoted as saying, We encourage them because of the safety angle. Yet competing Curtis Wright officials felt differently. An executive at the company stated, Sweaters hold up the assembly line. The federal government's Office of War Information issued a report concluding that the sweaters should not be worn in war manufacturing. Quote, it isn't a rumor that a tightly sweatered working companion takes a man's eyes off his machine. That's the end of the quote. Even Hollywood actress and sweater wearer Ann Sheridan chimed in with her expert opinion. Quote, Sweaters that are in good taste can be worn at war work as well as on the street or in the home. If sweaters worn by women are not in good taste, then they don't belong in the factory any more than they belong elsewhere. And that's the end of the quote. Local talks between the union and the company went absolutely nowhere. Neither side would budge an inch. G.B. Anderson, personnel manager for the company at the time, stood by the company's policy. He said that the policy was based on two considerations. Those were, quote, safety and the fact that the girls come here to work and not to be attractive to the men. That's the end of the quote. The union's next step was to take their case to the State Board of Mediation and Arbitration. And when that didn't work, they went all the way to Washington, D.C., turning the matter over to the United States Conciliation Service. Elizabeth Chrisman was appointed as the mediator between the two sides. And while being a woman may have been viewed as providing an edge to the sweater girls, the press was quick to point out that Ms. Chrisman did not wear sweaters. It took two months, but an agreement was finally hashed out. It allowed for Any woman that didn't work with moving machinery or didn't work on a job that required, you know, some sort of special type of safety equipment to continue wearing sweaters. That was about 75% of the women working in the plant. Now, those that did work in the more hazardous jobs would be required to wear a two-piece outfit. But unlike those awful Jeep suits, these new outfits came in two different styles and were cotton twill. Best of all, the company had to buy them for the women. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now, a few words from our retro sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, once there was a husband who was very fussy about his desserts. He liked puddings, but only the kind of puddings that his wife made for him. Well, of course, it's a lot of work to make good puddings, so this man's wife decided to play a little trick on him. What happened? Well, the wife who wrote us about this is right here in person, Mrs. Florence C., who lives at 25 Hillside Avenue, Washington Heights, New York City. Uh, Here's your letter, Mrs. C. Would you read us the rest of what you wrote, please? 
Certainly, Mr. Von Zell. I decided to try jello chocolate pudding. It only take it only took me a few minutes to whisk it up, and when supper time came, there it was. A big bowl full of rich, creamy, smooth chocolate pudding. Well, my husband came right back for the second helping. Said it was the most delicious pudding I had ever made. So then I told him about it. Told him that I had used the new jello chocolate pudding. He had to admit it surely was a success. Every bit as delicious as the old-fashioned kind. Well, thank you very much, Mr. C. And ladies, that is the way to make a hit with your husband, too. For the new Jell-O puddings have that real old-fashioned goodness. Creamy, smooth, full-flavored, and tempting. But they're far quicker and easier to make. There are three delicious Jell-O puddings to choose from. Rich chocolate, mellow butterscotch, and creamy, delicate vanilla. Yes, you like all three new Jell-O puddings. Real old-fashioned puddings made a new-fashioned way. So try them tomorrow. That commercial's from the October 10th, 1939 episode of The Aldridge Family and was titled Henry's Engagement. My wife and I had the pleasure of visiting the Jell-O Museum this past summer in Leroy, New York. Now, it's not a giant museum that I you know, suggest driving out of your way to see, but if you're in the area of Rochester, New York at some point, it is worth stopping off to see. Uh, it's actually three museums in one, and most people don't know that. It's the Jell-O Museum, there's an old car buggy museum in the basement of the building, and out front on the main street is the Leroy Mansion. Now, as I have mentioned in a previous podcast, powdered gelatin was invented by Peter Cooper. He is best remembered today for Cooper Union. That's a school that he founded in New York City in 1859. Hewitt never capitalized on his invention, but somehow years later, in 1897, the gelatin formula ended up in the hands of Pearl Waite. He was a carpenter in Leroy. His wife, May, supposedly thought it was a bit like jelly and hence came up with the name Jell-O. But Waite was not successful with selling the product either. So on September 9th of 1899, he sold the formula to a fellow Leroy citizen named Orda Francis Woodward. He sold it to him for just enough money to buy a home. At first, sales were very slow, but he eventually came up with the idea of giving away free samples and free Jell-O cookbooks to get the ball rolling. And since Jell-O is everywhere today, obviously, this worked. Jell-O continued to be manufactured in Leroy until 1964. That's when General Mills shut the plant down. The factory is still there and is just around the corner from the museum if you should go for a visit. And now for a few totally useless yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for what I like to call News of the Weird Past. And I chose to group these stories together because they all have one thing in common. That's love and marriage. Our first tidbit is dated January 25th of 1940. It was reported that a 38-year-old Oakland, California man named George Runyon wrecked his car. The reason? He decided to give his wife Frances a kiss, and then he lost control of the car. He ended up swerving across the street and barreling into the window of the local Salvation Army store. Luckily, neither were injured. Police did not file any charges against a couple because there's no law on the books that prevented a man from kissing his wife. Now, for our next story, I need to mention that I've always thought that my family tree was screwed up, and that's because my father's brother married my mother's sister. But I think that this story from December 26 of 1956 tops them all. Let's see if you can follow the logic of this story from Bishop Auckland in England. Now, the article I read was quite confusing, so I had to diagram it out on paper to make sure that I understood it correctly. First, in February of 1955, Irene Harris married William Gill. Then, 10 months later, Irene's dad married William's mom. That made Irene and William not only husband and wife, but now they were also stepbrother and stepsister to each other. As a side note, this actually happened to my grandparents. But wait, 
that's not all. On Christmas Eve of 1956, Irene's brother Douglas married William's sister, Joyce. That means that Douglas married the woman who was both his stepsister and his sister-in-law. If you don't follow all of this, a father, a daughter, and a son married a mother, a son, and a daughter, respectively. Try drawing that on your family tree. And our last story is dated June 5th of 1958 and is what I consider to be a really, really great love story. Now, I know I'm going to butcher the names here and the towns and so on because this is Italian, but I'll do my best. Uh, it started back in 1938 in the Italian town of Falciano. There, a 15-year-old Alba Gadotti and 16-year-old Rinaldo Medicini became engaged. One year later, Rinaldo was sent off to Greece to fight in World War II. A few months later, Alba received the sad news that Rinaldo had been killed in action. Alba was devastated by the news, and she became a cloistered Benedictine nun. Now, unbeknownst to her, Rinaldo had not been killed after all. Instead, he was badly injured, and he was moved from one hospital to the next to the next. He was unable to return home until 1946. That was eight years after their engagement, only to find out that his beloved Alba had dedicated her life to the church. So, with her mother superior observing, the two were reunited again, and it was very clear that they still carried the torch for each other. Alba asked the church to release her from her vows, but that required approval from the Pope himself. And as you know, the church doesn't do anything quickly. So they had to wait, get this, 10 years until Pope Pius granted her wish. The couple was married in May of 1958. That's 20 years after they had become engaged. And now for the answer to today's question of the day. And I had asked which native Australian act was the first to ever top the Billboard singles chart here in the United States. Was it one, Air Supply, two, the Bee Gees, three, Andy Gibb, four, Olivia Newton-John, or five, Helen Reddy? Well, it turns out only one of those uh, is native Australian. The other four are not. So which one did you choose? The answer is number five, Helen Reddy. She hit number one in 1972 with her classic song, I Am Woman. Uh, she hit number one two more times with Delta Dawn and Angie Baby. Now, technically, she was beat by the Bee Gees, who hit number one in August of 1971 with How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? But they are not native Australians. They were all born on the Isle of Man, which lies between Great Britain and Ireland. And as we know, their career stalled after that. They never had another hit. Oh, okay, maybe not. They had nine number one hits in total. Their youngest brother, Andy Gibb, also hit number one twice. Olivia Newton-John hit number one five times, but again, she was born in the United Kingdom. Last on my list was Air Supply, which had just, no, just one number one hit. That was the one that you love, but half of that duo is also from England. Besides Helen Reddy, the other native acts that hit number one were, in order of appearance on the chart, Rick Springfield, In Excess, Savage Garden, and recently, Goitier. Uh, the only other act on the list that I haven't mentioned was Men at Work, but their lead singer, Colin Hay, was born in Scotland. By the way, the reason I asked this question was because I saw a video, a surprising video, on Helen Reddy this summer. For a woman that seemed to be Everywhere in the 1970s, I didn't recognize her at all. Um, she's retired. She lives on a pension. She's in a small apartment in Australia. There's no evidence, no remnants of her professional life there. If you're curious, go to YouTube and enter the words Helen Reddy today, tonight, and the video will pop up. I hope you enjoyed today's story on the Sikorsky Sweater Girls as well as a question of the day on the first Australian to have a number one hit here in the United States. Listen to our retro sponsor, Jello, and of course, the news of the weird past tidbits. 
oddly, you know, it's a new school year here in the United States, and I started teaching in September, and some of my students mentioned they listened to this podcast, but the thing they hate the most is the retro spots. It's just old and outdated, yet I probably get more people writing to me saying that's their favorite part. So I guess everybody's got different tastes. Uh, if you'd like to read more true stories just like these, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They're Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Both are written by me, Steve Silverman, and they're available from your local bookseller online and from your local library. I've already scanned in and uploaded uh, the research materials that I've used for this uh, podcast. So just go to Facebook. Uh, you can go to www.facebook.com slash useless information podcast, and those materials will be there. If for some reason you'd like to contact me, simply drop me an email at useless at steve.silverman.name. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. Or you can visit my website, which is uselessinformation.org. That's uselessinformation.org. Uh, the Facebook page, of course, also has a link to me. Uh, seems like I'm doing this with every podcast, but I have to apologize for taking so long. Uh, the beginning of the school year, then I got sick, and then I had parents' night, and other things this week have kept me very, very busy. Um, I hope to have the next one uh, up in a timely manner, but I haven't started it yet, and you never know what's going to come up between now and then. But I will try my best. Uh, thanks for your patience, and uh, thanks again for listening. Bye.